and welcome to the PyPod podcast. My name is Michael Horn and I'm a Raspberry Pi enthusiast and blogger. With my friend Tim Richardson I organised the Cambridge Raspberry Jam and Pi Wars and together we helped to organise both Raspberry Pi Big Birthday Weekends. I first got hold of a Raspberry Pi in July 2012 and started blogging soon after. My first contact with the Raspberry Pi community was at the Milton Keynes Raspberry Jam where I made some great new friends, learned a lot, including how to solder, and started work on my first Raspberry Pi project, the Pi Corder. I would show you the Pi Corder, but like many great projects, it's in bits at the moment. I'm recording this podcast from the den at the bottom of my garden, which Tim and I recently refurbished. This podcasting lark is all new to me, but hopefully you'll find it interesting enough that you'll still be listening at the end. Let's start off with some Raspberry Pi news. The big news this week is that just recently the 10 millionth Raspberry Pi was manufactured and sold. That's just the main model though, and if you include the Raspberry Pi Zero, the original A and the A+, the number is actually way over that. A group from the community, journalists and dignitaries recently celebrated this milestone at the Houses of Parliament. There were some speeches including from David Cleveley, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Evan Upton and Director of Communications Liz Upton. There are also some very weird canapes and quite lovely champagne. The whole event only lasted two hours, but it was great to be involved. Also revealed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation this week was a new starter kit. Retailing at £99 and including a Pi, a keyboard, a mouse, a power supply, some other peripherals and a copy of Carrie Ann Philbin's book, Adventures in Raspberry Pi, the kit is, and I quote, unashamedly premium. It's not perhaps as good value for money as other kits supplied by the Pi Hut, CPC, Pimeroni and others, but all the components are of very high quality, according to Eben, who posted the news on the Foundation's blog. One interesting thing to note is the keyboard is in US format, because this is the largest market for the Pi. I'm hoping that a UK version will come out eventually, because keyboards without pound symbols are just weird. Next, the Magpie, the Raspberry Pi magazine, wasn't short of news this week either. In collaboration with Chip, the magazine is now available in the German language. To start with, it will be sold bi-monthly rather than monthly, but it will be available to buy in all good German news agents and it will be available by subscription. In case you didn't know, any subscriptions to the Magpie comes with a free Raspberry Pi Zero and accessories kit. It's well worth having if you're having difficulty getting hold of the Zero. That's it for the news. Now for some products information. I'm hoping to bring you an announcement about new and updated products, highlight new goodies that you might want to get hold of. First up, we have the Raspberry Pi Pro Hack from Alex Eames. Recently, a Kickstarter, the Pro Hack gives you access to the GPIO via protected female breakout holes. Included is a small breadboard which lets you prototype your circuits. And this has recently come into stock on Alex's own site, rasp.io, and is also available at Pimeroni and ModMyPi. There's a new Pi Zero case on the block, injection moulded with knockouts for the GPIO and a cover for the SD card. It comes via the Pi Hut and ModMyPi. At £5 it might seem a little expensive in comparison to the cost of the Zero, but it does provide very good protection. It's very tough plastic and good quality moulding and features the official Pi logo, in case that makes any difference to you. It's just the job if you need some all-round protection for your Pi, highly recommended. Also new out recently is the Zero Seg from the Pi Hut. Designed by average man Richard Saville, the Zero Seg is a small 8-digit 7-segment display that is good for doing things like clocks, temperature readouts, Twitter notifications, in fact anything you can think of that needs text output because with the board comes a Python library that lets you display and scroll text across it. And lastly from Pimeroni is the Moat. It comes as a little module that connects to your Pi or other computer via USB and gives you four little ultra bright RGB LED sticks that you can control independently. I'm going to get a hold of some of these for the lighting in the den so you'll likely see them on a future episode. Or if you're listening to the audio version, you won't see them. The complete kit comes in at £40, which actually isn't bad at all. 
As well as Pepperoni, I know the Pie Hut will be stocking them soon, so you can take your pick from two of the major retailers. That's all on the shopping front. Let me know if you decide to get any of these bits and pieces and what you think of them. And I want to make this a little bit more interactive in future and we'll have a talkback section and maybe some guest reviewers. Now I want to look at crowdfunding, see if there's any new campaigns out there. Okay, so normally there's at least one out there worth looking at. However, the only one I can find at the moment is the Boolean Box. Great name, let's have a look at the product. This is where I'm going to get a bit controversial on this podcast already. First episode and we're going to be a bit of controversy. The Boolean Box is basically a Raspberry Pi starter kit with added educational material. All aimed at girls. At the risk of sounding like I'm on Dragon's Den, let me tell you where I am with this. Now, I'm, I am all for equality and I support the whole idea of girls learning how to code if that's what they want to do. I'm not a great fan of the recent trend in positive discrimination, but, you know, whatever works. However, this particular Kickstarter goes a little bit nutty. They put together a pretty good starter kit with a keyboard, a mouse, some electronic components, a case and a breadboard. All good. But you know what they've done? They've made the keyboard and mouse pink. That's right, in the year 2016, the only route we have to aim a product at girls is to make it pink. The price is right, $99 for the early bird, rising to $140 after the first 500, with increments in between. That's competing with the best of them, including the official Raspberry Pi starter kit, and of course Kano. Or is it Kano? We just don't know. But pink? Seriously? In 2016? Anyway, I'll climb down off my soapbox now and I'll move on to some upcoming events. Saturday, 17th of September, seems to be a very popular date for events. There are seven on the Foundation's jam calendar alone. Speaking of which, if you're going to be running an event, make sure it goes on the calendar. raspberrypi.org slash jam and just add your event to the calendar. So, on the 17th, there are jams in Cambridge, Cornwall, Huddersfield, Lee near Manchester and Torbay. Further afield, there are also meetups in Hazlitt, New Jersey in the United States and also Bogota in Colombia. Next week, there are jams in Montreal, Seattle, Sacramento and then on Saturday the 24th, the Cotswold Raspberry Jam takes place in Cheltenham. Also, if you're in the Twickenham area on Thursday the 22nd, there's a coding evening. Now, you might not have heard of coding evenings, so a quick bit of info. Coding evenings are a way for IT professionals and educators to get together and share knowledge and experience. It's not just limited to the Raspberry Pi, any technical knowledge is welcomed so that teachers can benefit. I've been to a couple of the evenings in Peterborough and they're an ideal opportunity to get involved without a lot of time commitment. For teachers they're invaluable as they help to forge relationships with industry and give the opportunity to share things like best practice between each other. If you don't know about it, go to www.codingevening.org. Looking a little further into the future, the long-running Preston Raspberry Jam is on 3rd of October, Leeds Raspberry Jam is on the 5th, and there's a Coding Pi Science Day, great name, in CERN, Switzerland on Friday the 7th. The 8th of October looks to be another bumper day, with events happening in Guildford, Ipswich, Belfast in Northern Ireland, and another one in Torbay. If you'd like to advertise your event on this podcast, just make sure it's on the calendar, and I'll pick it up next time I prepare for an episode. That's it for events. Let's take a look at some feature products that have come to my attention in the past couple of weeks. These may be familiar to some of you who read my blog regularly. First up, we have an innovative solution to the problem of old age. A programmer called Dusted has an elderly relative who's losing her sight and motor skills. It means that she can't use her CD player anymore. So Dusted set up a Raspberry Pi to read some RFID cards and then play music accordingly. He was going for ease of use and as you'll see from the pictures in the notes and hopefully on this video cast, it's nothing pretty to look at, but importantly the solution works and that's the important thing in this case. Next up, Vince Weaver has taken chip tunes back a couple of decades by using an old chip 
at General Instrument AY-3-8910, which you can find in old gaming consoles and home computers. He's using the Raspberry Pi to trigger things off, but most of the work is done by the chip itself, just as it would have been in ye olde days gone yesteryear, or something. I've always loved retro projects, and this next one's no exception. Andy Phelan had an old 1942 Crossley radio that he's put a Raspberry Pi Zero and a display into to create a bedside clock. It also pulls down and displays the current outside temperature from the Weather Underground API. It's slightly ridiculous as a bedside clock, it's pretty big, but he certainly seems to have had fun doing it. And last but not least, from Europe comes a great project from master's student Eric Unovic. Eric studies in Switzerland, and for his master's project, he's created a miniature motorbike which, given a destination, balances and drives itself. Strapped to the top of the bike is a Raspberry Pi and a Navio 2 add on board. The Navio 2 has little plug in sensors which monitors the orientation of the bike, and then the Pi issues course and balance corrections based on the data. The bike can travel over 35 miles per hour, which is 60 kph without falling over. Eric's hoping that eventually he can do the same for a full-size bike and beat a human-driven motorbike in a race. The only video footage I've got of it is in French, but it looks highly impressive and is definitely my top project for this podcast. So that's it for this episode. I'd love to hear what you think, so leave a comment if you can. If you've got any ideas as to how I could improve things next time, I'm all ears. And if you've seen any great projects, articles or news, feel free to feed that back to me either on Pyapod or on Twitter. Catch you next time.